Welcome to Drive for Service, a podcast to inspire higher quality of service. Welcome everybody to our next episode of Drive for Service. My name is Melania Battiston and I'm the Ed Sommelier, a wine buyer at Medler Restaurant in Chelsea in London. And next to me, David O'Connor, the co-owner, a restaurant manager of Medler Chelsea. Hello everyone. So today we're very excited to introduce our next guest. And David? Would you like to introduce her? Sure. So we've got sommelier and restaurateur, Katie Exton, the owner of Lawn Restaurant in Victoria. Welcome, Katie. Welcome, Katie. Hi, guys. Nice to be with you. <laughs> Katie, let's start with your career story. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> so I think actually if I'd have asked myself as I was graduating university, you know, what do you think you'll be doing as a job? I honestly think there is no way I ever would have thought um, that I'd be working in hospitality and that I'd, I'd own a restaurant. So I came to hospitality um, not because I'd been to like school, hospitality school or anything like that. I, at university, I did have a job working in a restaurant, which was a, a way to just kind of make ends meet. And I did, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I loved the people that I worked with. I loved the buzz of service, but I think I had just seen it and I was, I was good at it as well. Um, which made me enjoy it. But I think I had just sort of seen it as a means to an end. I really liked food and drink when I was um, younger. And I had thought I would go down the route of maybe being um, a buyer for Waitrose or Sainsbury's or one of the supermarkets. And so sort of post-university, wasn't really sort of sure what to do. And my my dad suggested to me that wine might be something of interest. He said at that time, there were not a lot of women um, there was Janice Robinson, obviously, the queen. Um, but, you know, there, there were not a lot of people, women working in the wine industry. So I said, OK, fine. I grew up in a household where we, he drank wine, but it was quite sort of go to Wadbins and we didn't have a cellar or anything like that. So I said, yeah, OK, that could be interesting. And he had been at university with somebody who was making um, or growing grapes to make ice wine in Canada. So he said to me, you could you could go and do that. And I was like. Yeah, all right, that, that sounds pretty fun. So he took me for my birthday, um, which would be my 21st, I think, uh, to Vinopolis, which was this sort of wine experience down in Borough. And it just like opened this whole world that I realised I knew nothing about. And one thing that I've learned about myself as I've gone through life is that if there's something I quite like the look of and I don't know anything about it, I'm like, I want to know everything about this. Um, I don't. I don't want to like not be able to do this. And I suddenly was like, oh my God, I want to know everything about wine. And so I went off to, to Canada with my now husband um, and we had a really good time there, but it was such hard work. And I realized I don't think winemaking is going to be the thing for me. And also realistically in the UK, that just was not going to be a sort of a potential career. So came back to um, the UK, we moved to London and I thought, okay, I'm going to keep going with this wine thing. I'm really enjoying this. And at that time, uh, Majestic Wines had a graduate scheme. So I thought, okay, that seems like a no brainer. And I started there and I started, which, you know, everyone had to do. I started at the bottom. So I was a delivery driver down in Wimbledon. Yeah. Um, and it was, there was no Google Maps. Um, I used to have to get an A to Z out and look at <laughs> places. And I just moved to London. And it was just a, it was a great way to get to know London. And I was, learning about wine. They put you through your WSET. There were tastings and it was great. And I was loving all of the wine side. But again, just retail, I just knew it wasn't sort of quite the right fit. And there'd been just a couple of things that had sort of happened in my past, conversations with people. And I'd read this article um, about sommeliers and actually one of the people in that then became my, uh, my boss. And I just thought, I mean, sommelier seems pretty glamorous you basically just stand around recommending wine to people. And this one article that had been written in the Times, all of these sommeliers, as people like Gerard and Ronan and Terry, they were dressed in like black, really cool suits. And I was like, this looks cool. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe that could be something. And so I sent my CV off to loads of restaurants. And I was living in Clapham. I was at the Majestic at Clapham at this point. And I'd actually, this was sort of October time, and I'd booked dinner at Shea Bruce. And I knew Shea Bruce was like this brilliant restaurant. 
So I'd sent out everything and I'd kind of hoped that Shea Bruce would, would reply, but, you know, nobody replied. Apart from, I did get a response from the Smini at Shea Bruce. So I went along to my uh, interview with him. You know, I, I, I'd only worked in a Mexican restaurant at this point, but just out of pure coincidence, there had been this meetup when I had been um, picking grapes in Australia with someone that we both knew. And so we made this kind of like connection mm-hmm. during the interview. And I think it is probably for that reason alone that he looked at this quite clueless, um, you know, 22 year old girl and thought, yeah, it's probably not going to work, but let's give it a shot. And from the moment that I walked in, which was in January, I'd eaten at Shea Bruce and it had blown me away. And I knew at that point I was going to be working there. From the moment that I walked in the door, I just loved it. And it just was, it was such a magical time to be in that restaurant as well. They just run the um, Observer Food Monthly sort of best restaurant. The restaurant was packed, but with the most incredible buzz, the wines that I was learning and tasting about, the people I was meeting. It was, it was just absolutely brilliant. And I think just from that day, my entire career just changed and I I think Jeff Bezos sort of talks about you know if you find something that becomes your passion you're so lucky to have done that and suddenly this thing which I loved was my job and that was it and then I never looked back so six and a half years later I leave Shea Bruce for a little bit I go and work at the square which was when David was there it was incredible very very hard um Terry who had employed me went back to Canada where he was from I ran back as quickly as I could to Shea Bruce because I loved it. And I became the head um, sommelier and wine buyer there. And then I'm coming up to 30. And I think this is probably something which, I don't know, it would be interesting to hear your point of view on this. But as a woman coming up to 30, I started having to think about, I wanted a family and I knew that. And I loved working at Shea Bruce, but I knew it wasn't going to be realistic for me to be able to do that job full time to what Bruce would want and expect from me and to be able to have a family. Actually, then Sarah came on to be head smithy and proved me wrong, but I don't think I have the driving capacity for work that she did. But at that point, that's what I felt. So I thought to myself, okay, I'm either going to have to go down the kind of food and beverage kind of manager in a hotel or bigger company, or I think I've got to open my own business. And I was like, I'm not really sure. I think I want to open my own restaurant. I handed my notice in at Shea Bruce and it took me three and a half years from thinking, okay, this is what I want to do to opening Lawn. So during that time, I took a little bit of time out. I went and worked on the sales side just to check. And I was like, yeah, I want to do this. I want to open my own business. And then in the meantime, um, the then head sommelier at the River Cafe asked me if I'd like to go and work there. and I. It's just, it, it's a, a restaurant you don't say no to. So I said, yes, yeah, sure. But I explained to them, I was very upfront. I want to open my own place. And they said, look, working full time for us is, and it was a lot less hours. So I said, yeah, all right, sure. I can do that. And then I just loved working there as well. It was another restaurant that was just amazing. And I was learning. And so the kind of push to get the restaurant open disappeared a little bit I was just having so much fun my husband and I got married so my savings got depleted (laughs) but eventually I got there and then yeah 2017 February I opened lawn and that's where I am now amazing so long but hopefully compressed answer there for you (laughs) in terms of opening lawn um you know you've explained your career as a sommelier but in terms of opening a restaurant and in terms of service and, and what you wanted to do with that? I mean, did you manage the restaurant or you had help? or? I mean, so even at Shea Bruce, there were times when, when I'd become head sommelier that, you know, I would help out a little bit with management. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed that. Um, and then when I was at the River Cafe again, I helped a little bit with management. So I was, I was doing a little bit more of sort of both sides. But when I did decide I was going to open lawn, I knew that at that point, I thought I could probably juggle both. Um, but I did know that realistically, I was opening up to be 
the operator and, you know, GM, and I was going to have to get help from the wine point of view. But I think I had, I think I'd had enough experience of being a manager to get a flavor of what it was going to be like. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is being a manager of your own business is always going to be different from being a manager of somebody else's business. And, you know, one of the things I realized at Shea Bruce, I really genuinely worked at Shea Bruce to a level that I cared so much. I really did treat it like it was my own restaurant. And I think Bruce had an amazing ability to get people that worked that way and, and I'm sure still does. And so I was giving so much of myself. So in that aspect, it wasn't that different. But, you know, one of the funnest, I think one of the funnest things about being a sommelier is that you can spend other people's money on wines that you want to drink. <laughs> but when it's your own money, effectively, or your company's money, yeah. it, it just kind of feels a little bit sort of different. And everything, you know, the buck's always finishing with you um, when it's your own restaurant. And, you know, the kind of nitty gritty, the toilets get blocked. You've got to sort that out. You can't pass that up the chain to somebody else. So all of those things kind of do change a little bit. But I don't think I learned it was a very steep learning curve. It was very, very challenging opening my own restaurant. But I think the management um, of kind of service and stuff was probably one of the areas I felt more comfortable in. Okay. So you developed your vision from the restaurants you worked at, you mean? Yeah. I mean... <sighs> I'll keep talking about Shea Bruce probably all of the way through this because it's just you know, such an integral part of what formed you know, my career and the person that I ended up becoming. Um, but I think that, you know, it was, it was, it was during that time that I, I learned about, you know, Bruce would always be talking about when you went to restaurants, what's the hospitality like? What was the service like? And he's a chef that does care about your dining experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was definitely through Shea Bruce and eating out that I started mm -hmm. thinking about mm -hmm. front of house. And, you know, the, one of the things about Lawn that I think is quite unique um, is that it's a restaurant that is owned by a front of house person rather than being chef led. You know, and right mm -hmm. now it's very much more the trend that it's chef led yeah. and the manager is, you know, a hired employee. And that's not the case at Lawn. And that doesn't mean, of course, by any means that the food is less important. But I think we are, you know, like Medler is, we are one of the restaurants in London that puts a real emphasis on front of house. Just your dining experience, you know, it's yeah. service and hospitality is such a key part of that. But you're also front of house, you are cu you're curating somebody's evening experience. And one of the key things, I think, Somebody who cares about it, thinks about acoustics in the restaurant, makes me sound incredibly old. But actually, the acoustics is so important. You go and eat because you want to communicate and socialize and interact with the people next to you. And it's so annoying if you can't hear them. But so many restaurants don't think about things like that. And in fact, our acoustics were terrible when we first opened. And I knew it the minute I could just hear the sound in that space. And I knew immediately we had to get it changed. And when we put these, they're quite unattractive, but we put these panels in in the roof. And I walked in that Monday morning and it was just, there wasn't even anyone in the restaurant, but it just sounded so different. And I knew it, we'd got it right. But that's something that I think is, you know, what separates those of us that care about front of house from where it is more of a, yeah, an afterthought in sort of chef-led restaurants. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you, I think you pointed something quite interesting before on your move from Shabur's at some point and then you went to the square. Except for David, what is the reason that makes you move to the square? So Terry, who was my my boss um, and had been my mentor, he had he had gone away and I'd had the opportunity to be effectively the kind of fill in head simile for a little bit. And I didn't think I was capable of doing it, but I had no choice and I did it and I bloody loved it. And then he came back and he was, you know, a dear, dear friend and I loved working with him. But my whole life, like my landscape, my perspective had changed and he just wanted everything to go back. And I was like, no, mm. no, no, I can't do that. And he'd also sort of said to me, I think long term, maybe actually short term, I'm going to be going back to Canada. 
And so I was like, okay. And I said, I have to go. Like, I can't, I want our friendship to stay, but I can't wait around for you to, to do this. And being head Mini at, at Shea Bruce, I knew at that point was my kind of dream job. So I wasn't just going to sit around and wait for it. And I, I love Shea Bruce so much. I never felt the need to actually go somewhere else because it was just keeping me so satisfied and I was learning so much. But I knew I needed to leave. And so I had looked at a couple of things. In fact, Terroir was just opening at the time. And I maybe was thinking about going there. And Nigel Platts Martin, I think I'd probably spoken to David. And they, they just said to me, come to the square. You know, you can be a sommelier, you can taste more, you can learn more. It's not a bad um, opportunity for you. And at some point, Nigel said, you'll be able to go back to, to Shea Bruce. Um, although Bruce still then made me interview for the job later, I remember, which I was pretty, I was like, oh my God. Um, but uh, yeah, so I went there and I'm, I'm very, very glad I went there. Um, I found it, I found it a very, very challenging time. But I think what I've learned all of the way through my career is that you learn more when things don't go the way that you want and things are hard, that's when you've really got to dig deep and self-reflect and think about what matters to you. When things are going well and it's all just kind of bobbing along, you don't spend that time really sort of yeah, self-reflecting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the harder times, and I mean, God, as a restaurateur, you learn that every single week. And that was so hard. But, you know, you're learning every single time because things are going wrong all of the time. So you're, you're always learning. But yeah, you, you don't learn so much when it's going well. Oh, interesting. Mm. So, Katie, you touched on it already. Um, yeah. But I'd just like to go back to the importance of service for you yeah. in, in a restaurant or business. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said to you, I, sadly, I think it is something that these days seems to have less emphasis. But I think, as well, you have to look at the just landscape that we've got right now where it's so difficult to find staff, the costs of things. An easy way to save money is, you know, how can we get rid of, of staff and make that kind of more streamlined? And so I understand perhaps why it's become this way, but I think it's just such a great shame because I think that the front of house is so important to your restaurant experience. And, you know, I think TripAdvisor will tell you that London's got something like 40,000 restaurants or something. But if you look at your restaurant, Medlar, you look at Chez Bruce, where we both worked, you, you look at my restaurant, we're in like the top 250. And I, I think that that is because there is a lot of really good food in London. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of that extra element that we bring, which is from the front of house. So I think it's so key. And I mean, front of house has also, it's changed so much in the time that I've worked in the industry. And you know, I used to think I've not worked in the industry for very long. It turns out it's actually now quite a long time. Um, it's like 20 years, but I like to think of myself still <laughs> as a bit of a spring chicken, but I've got more hair than you, David, yeah. so I'm still doing uh, I'm still doing all right. <laughs> but when we first started, you know, restaurants were always a bit perhaps kind of slow with things like technologies and improvements. And so the idea of like using an online um like diary to write notes about people was seen as being like really quite edgy and cool and you would deeply profile a customer but I think actually with social media becoming such a huge thing yeah. now your data is something which is it's an incredibly valuable part of you but it's also something people are quite protective of and so I think that we've gone from this place where we still have to deliver this experience I think Fundamentally, the most important thing that you can do in a world where you feel quite anonymous is to make someone, when they come into your restaurant, feel valued, feel special and feel seen. But you've got to do that in a way that also doesn't make them feel that they're just some data that you've remembered. Or maybe they've even like been able to, you've been able to extrapolate that from your online booking platform. You've got to give them this human experience where you look at them and you do know them. You don't just know whether they like still or sparkling water. That isn't, that isn't now enough. And so I think it's, it's been, yeah, even in the few years, decades that I've worked, that I, how 
you make somebody feel special has just changed. And you've got to constantly be evolving and thinking about that and thinking about as well, even pre and post COVID, how our experience of interaction, interacting with each other and with staff has had to change. And you've got to be so responsive to that. But if you get it right, what's just so incredibly rewarding is you know that you're creating those evenings that you will have experienced in a restaurant when the food is great and you remember the food. The food was brilliant, but it's just that whole evening, the buzz, and you can feel it from the people that are next to you. They're having a great night as well. And you just walk away like you've just had this like hug of, of life. And that's what a really great meal in a restaurant delivers but it's the experience of it's not just the food. And, you know, I, I love that when customers say to me things like, oh, you know what? Like, I came to your restaurant the night that we proposed to, I proposed to my girlfriend and it just was the best night ever. And now we want to come every single year and you build up relationships with regulars. So they decide that they want to have their child's christening in your restaurant. <laughs> like, that's so rewarding from a front of house perspective. And I think that's, that's what restaurants need to do more of. Some restaurants, you go in there to eat, but really, I think the best restaurants are when it's about more than that. Totally agree. And I guess you do have um, many regulars, like coming back to mm. Lorne, right? Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of regulars. And the regulars change as well. And I always think that's great. I always, I mean, you can't do this, but I'd always love to know when somebody, you know, who's a really good regular then suddenly stops coming because I'd like to think we haven't done anything yeah. wrong. Um, but true. yeah, we have, we have lots of regulars and I love that. And during COVID, I realized that was one of the things that I, I actually missed the most because, you know, you'd have your family Zoom calls and people were still interacting and you were going to the shops and things. But what I missed was that sort of in-between layer of small talk with people that you know a little bit about, but it it never kind of gets really deep. It's just that lovely chewing the fat of life. And so when we did start doing the like lawn at home, I mean, I talked to some of those customers for like 20 minutes about nothing. And it was longer than I was probably speaking to some of my family for, but it was just so nice. And I I love that element that you get with regulars as as well. It's just, it's a really nice relationship. Nice. Yeah. Moving on to your teams, um, yeah. Katie, how do you build and motivate teams at Lawn? <sighs> um, I think that, I mean, your team is obviously the most important part of, you know, of, of what we do. Because I can say all of these things, but they've got to implement it. They've got to feel it. Um, so I think, first of all, it's really important that you, know, you, you have talked about, you know, what principles are that you have behind service your is it your brilliant basics and magic touches so you know at lawn we have some core values um which you know i believe are really important to what i think the restaurant should be and i have to review them i've got to get the staff on board with getting those and understanding those and and understanding what lawn is and they've got they've got to be the right person as well to be on board with that and you'll probably learn within the first week or two if someone's going to be the right fit for that or not. And then once you, I think, have that, I think it's now, I think it's about empowering your staff. Um, and that is in different ways. It's, you know, it's via training. It's making them, I think, feel valued. I think it's about them enjoying their job. It's about giving them a work-life balance. Um, um, someone told me once about, you know, if you think about sort of the employment structure kind of being like this pyramid and the people at the top, there are fewer of them, but they're the decision makers. Actually, you know, maybe think about flipping that the other way around and the decision makers are that base layer, which are the more sort of junior people that you have more of. And I thought that was just quite an interesting concept. And I don't think I could actually necessarily always, you need one person to perhaps kind of make the decisions. But I've found that what that made me realize is I think there are more things I need to let go of. You know, I like to be in control of everything. I want to be the one that's deciding everything. But actually, maybe I should let the other staff feel in control of what we do. So, you know, things things like before I had to do all the beers, I had to do the wines. I, I wanted to do all of it. That's one of the reasons I wanted to open a restaurant because I loved all of those things. But now I let 
the team decide. And I think they they enjoy that. They feel that what they're doing matters, you know, and that it it actually it, they're part of the business. And I think empowering them is a key part of of doing it. And then, yeah, I think just enjoyment is so important. Good star food, that's really really key. Um, I think if people are fed. How can we say like food and experience of eating and drinking so important if we then, you know, aren't doing that ourselves? So they've got to be really well fed. They've <laughs> got to be happy. They've got to have a good work-life balance. And I think for some people, it isn't necessarily the case for everyone. It certainly was for me and a lot of people that need, I think you need to grow as a person all of the time. And I think we can offer that in terms of developing your know, training in other areas, but also letting them grow in other areas if that's what is of interest to them. So we've got a brilliant employee right now who studied photography. And for me, it's about letting her know. I don't want her to get to a point where she thinks she she can't work at Lawn because she has to do more of her photography. I'm like, you can do both for as long as you want and come and speak to me and we will find the time to make that work. And I don't want people to feel that, you know, one's got to be at the, at the price of another. Mm -hmm. Would you like to share your core values with us? Um, yeah, sure. So, so we have four core values. Um, the first <laughs> one is exceptional quality. And that's you know, just across the board. So it's easy. Um, it's service, food, drink. If something isn't exceptional quality, it shouldn't be at lawn. Um, the second one is about the team and that the team is always better than, you know, one person alone. And so, you know, that from a front of house point of view, will work you know, like you guys will. We have sections in the restaurant and it's really important that people look after the people in their section because it's how you build a relationship and a customer feels that they're being looked after and taken care of by that one person. Mm -hmm. But equally at the same time, if you can see your colleague is having a tough night because all of their tables have sat, how does the team work together to support that person because they need to still be able to build those bonds. So it will be things like you don't go into someone's section and take the order because that's a really key relationship building point. But you can go in and you can clear the plates and you can take the cutlery away. And that's a very sort of small interaction where you won't be noticed, but you're supporting one of your team members. Equally, team in terms of front of house and kitchen, how we talk to each other, the respect that we have. So it's just, you know, no one individual is more important than than the team. Um, we always say that you know change is good. Um, I think that that's you know something that can be quite difficult because mm -hmm. people don't like change. And if something's just kind of working, it's easier. But change is good and it's necessary. So we sit down a lot of the time and talk about it. And if we can't justify why we do something or why it's good for the business, why is it there? So we do that. And then it, the other one is just always like, you know, keep improving, look forward. Um, and yeah, so those are our sort of four right. core values. And how do you make sure you mention exceptional quality at all times and in all departments? So how do you make sure that all these standards are met? Because you said before you're a bit of a control freak when it comes to... Because if I'm doing restaurant. my job properly, <laughs> I've instilled that into the staff. So if I've told them it's exceptional quality and I've hired them because I think they get that, I have to trust that yeah. what they're choosing is exceptional quality. And you know, I, I'll go in and if I taste something and I don't think it is exceptional quality, I'll question them on it. And if they go through the thought process mm -hmm. and explain to me, because also a lot of these things, of course, are subjective to a certain degree. Um, and sometimes, you know, there'll be things on that aren't my taste, but if they can tell me why it's gone on, And I go, yeah, all right, fair enough. Um, but yeah, I, I have to trust that if I'm doing my job properly, that, you know, I, they'll be doing it as well and everything meets that mark. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Great. Um, so Katie, the role of the sommelier in the wine service, mm. in your view? I mean, I think it's quite interesting because Lund doesn't actually have a sommelier. Um, at the moment, well, we, we have at certain parts. And I think that, I think the sommelier is really key in some restaurants. I also don't think it is necessary in all restaurants. Um, but I guess fundamentally, 
the sommelier is is there to help somebody find a great bottle of wine like the is what they're looking for and it might be that you know they don't properly know what they're looking for but it's for you to listen to that and translate what they are saying into what they actually want and for some people that will be very clear because a lot of people in London know a lot about wine and um, that come to our restaurants and a lot of them know more than I do about wine um, and you're listening to them. But then there are other people, um, you know, I, I remember at Chez Bruce, somebody said, um, oh, we were wanting to get some wine. And the waiter said, oh, I'll get the sommelier. And I heard them say, brilliant, is that red or white? And so, you know, I knew at that point, OK, I'm going in here and I need to not patronise these people because they've probably saved up for this meal. It's going to be really special to them. They don't even know what a sommelier is. So, and here is this like wine list that's big and I need to try and help them and, and not kind of patronize mm-hmm. them. So yeah, you've got to work with that customer wherever they are on the wines, um, you know, kind of enjoyment spectrum and get them a brilliant bottle of wine because you are paying more for a bottle of wine in a restaurant than you would at home. So I think the role of a sommelier as well is you do bring the experience of the wine up. Um, a bottle of wine that you know, has cost X amount, but it's got a restaurant markup. I think by talking about it, by letting them know what they're going to get, it helps bring that wine into something that is more special. And my husband's, well, I think awful for this. We can have the same bottle of wine at home and he says, I don't really like this. And then we have it in a restaurant. It's like, oh, this is incredible. I love this wine. <laughs> and it drives me up the wall because then, you know, something that he's loved I've gone and bought for him as a lovely thing and he drinks it at home and he goes, I don't really like this. What is this? And I'm like, oh my God. But he's so yeah. influenced by the experience of drinking um, in terms of where he is. And I think the sommelier brings that extra enjoyment for him. Do you build your own wine list then, Lauren? Or do you have... Um... It's collaborative. Um, so at different times, depending on who we have working for us. Um, sometimes I do a little bit more. Sometimes I do a bit less. I'm, I'm on maternity leave right now. Um, so, and I, I have a, a colleague that I used to work with at Chez Bruce who is there. And so he's doing some of the wine buying. There's been times in the past that if I've had employees that are really into the wine, then, you know, to empower them, I let them do the wine buying. Then if those people aren't around, I take some of the wine buying right. back. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's collaborative. And is an area that you like, do you enjoy most in wine or? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, I like probably sort of varieties more. So, you know, like everyone, I'm, well, I've always been told I have a very classical palette, <laughs> um, which I'm totally okay with. So I love, love white burgundy. I love Chardonnay. I love Pinot Noir. I love Nebbiolo and Syrah. But I worked at the River Cafe for three and a half years oh, yeah. and spent a lot of time going to Italy. Um, so I do love Italian wines, more Northern. Um, yeah, I go to, to Piedmont. Um, nearly every single year, um, pre-COVID anyway, we used to go. So I adore Piedmont, love Tuscany. I do like Burgundy. I can't really afford to drink Burgundy anymore. Um, I've been to Australia quite a few times and made great relationships there. So I think, you know, where, where you get those mm. experiences, I think leads you to, to kind of want to know more about yeah, the people about and the places. Yeah. And my sister um, has been living in the States um, for quite a long time mm. and she was in San Francisco and so again we went over and visited and that was really interesting for me because I had been not not snobby I thought the wines were good but they were I just thought they were expensive and so I tend to, to kind of think oh but then having gone there and seen the people I, I really fell in love with yeah. quite a lot of California and now Oregon wines so yeah but it's Pinot I love Pinot Noir um, I can't look forward to Pinot Noir but I do And do you think like, um, since you started at Shepherds, your experience as a uh, sommelier, have you seen like a trend changing or now there is more of something people are requesting, something particular rather than before? Um, look, when nat- natural wine as such was not even a thing that was talked about, I think within the hospitality and sommelier world, it's a subject that gets an awful lot of airtime. I think obviously if you go to different parts of London as well, you'll you'll see a lot more natural wine. Um, in our restaurant, just to give you an idea, mm. which is, you know, in Southwest London, 
Um, we only have, we do have some wines that are skin contact wines, um, which would you know, be called orange wines. Um, but we don't sort of list them as that. But then we do have a couple of wines that clearly colour-wise are sort of darker. So yeah. you know, we put a little section in called orange wines. And a customer said to me, what are these orange wines? And they'd not even heard of it. And it kind of put it into perspective for me because I was like, oh my God, everybody, everybody knows about natural wines. And they don't. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. obviously that that certainly is a thing. But I think people care so much more about provenance of things. So even mm. if it's not necessarily natural more people want to know is this organic is this biodynamic and so you know our response often to it is I mean a lot of our wines will be because they are just smaller families where you know they they care about the Mm -hmm. vineyards it's normally where they live and smaller producers I think you know that that is it's that kind of loop resonate try and hold off if you can um so often I do have to kind of check if something's organic I'll generally know but you know whether they actually got certified or not but I think that definitely does matter okay um I don't know I mean you see little mini things like I think you know Sauvignon Blanc obviously had its day and I think that's kind of dropped down a little bit now Malbec had its moment but again I don't see actually Malbec kind of being quite as popular right now but I would say that the southwest London, which is where I've always worked, mm. palette hasn't changed that much. They like mm. yeah, classical yeah. wines, um, which is good because yeah, that's you what like I it like as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we all like it, I think. But how do you how did you develop your palette? Um, so I think so Terry Threlfall, um, who took over after Jason, one of your previous guests, was the the sommelier at Shea Rusen. I think I think it's very, very likely that if he hadn't been the head sommelier, I wouldn't have ended up um, being the wow. person that I am and doing what I did. So he was like integral and key to my development. And I guess, yeah, I mean, he, he, he was my mentor. Um, and we just, our palettes were so aligned. And I was tasting with somebody who was a, a little bit more, you know, he was North American. He was a little bit more kind of laid back and relaxed. When I'm, you know, if you went and worked at Gordon Ramsay, it was quite strict. As a commie sommelier, you were polishing glasses all day and it would take you months before you could speak to a customer. But at Shea Bruce, Terry's a bit more kind of laid back in that mm-hmm. sense. And I think that helped a lot because I hadn't had the sort of classical sort of training. But we were just enjoying tasting so much. And I think he loved it because... He was teaching someone that just got it, you would say. And so when he would say something, I'd be like, yeah. And I remember the first time, for instance, I tried Mast and a Mast Gasset Blanc. I had no idea what these wines were. And he gave me a little taste of it. And I just was like, what is this wine? And I was like, it's like it's it's got Chardonnay, but also like, is there Viognier or mm-hmm. something? And I could just watch his eyes like... <gasps> Oh my God, like she's just getting it. And I'm not like, I'm I'm not a great blind taste. You've, you know, I think you've got to, if you're practicing, you can be good at it. But if you're not, sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. But he was like, oh my God. And then I remember as well, someone brought in, oh, actually I might've been on the wine list. I'm not sure. It was a, it was a coat roti from René Rustang. And I opened it up and poured a little bit of it to kind of check it wasn't corked. And it was, it was dark, and it was really sort of meaty, Put it up on the top, my little taster, so I could taste it later. I came back to it. I think I'd forgotten about it. I came back to it at the end of service and it just, it just completely transformed. And it had this beautiful sort of like smoky bacon now, dark chocolate. And I said these words again to Terry. And I mean, it was just like I was, you know, giving him like drugs. He was like, <laughs> oh my God, she gets it. And so we just loved it. And we just like fed off each other so much. And I just wanted to know more all of the time. And I wanted to taste with him. And at that time, wine was just so much more affordable. So on the Northcote Road, which was near where I was living, um, there was a, a wine shop. And I went in and I bought a bottle of Moray Saint-Denis um, from Rumier. And I could go into a shop and buy a bottle of Rumier, which wow. is you know just not possible. And I think it was like... I think it was 50 pounds and you know that that was expensive but yeah. also it was it was totally worth the splurge and so we drank with me and when I started at Shea Bruce 
you know, we had on the list Chloe Saint-Jacques from Rousseau and it was less than 300 pounds. And so again, I could taste these wines. And so that was it as well, because you didn't have Google. So I would have to read about the wines in a book. I'd actually look them up. And I was like, wow, Mm -hmm. this is mega. Like I'm trying these incredible wines and I'm trying them and they do taste really, really good. So it was just, it was brilliant. And he influenced um, my palate hugely. Um, Yeah. It's interesting. Were you reading a lot as well about wines where we just mainly like tasting? So you you read, like I said, you could go online and, you know, the internet did exist, but it was, there just, there wasn't the same amount of stuff yeah. being written about. So there was um, a book that was called Wine Behind the Label. Um, and I think the guy wrote it, I don't know, maybe every sort of two, three years. And it would be, you'd look it up and all of the wines that we would list at Chez Bruce were on that more or less. Um, and you would read a little bit of blurb about the producer and then it would just kind of have, you know, a cu- literally like the wines that they made and maybe just even a score. And that was it, you know, mm-hmm. so that's all you got. Um, but that was sort of enough to kind of get you rolling. So I remember that I would, from my point of view, I would study the wine list. You know, I'd, I'd read about sort of three or four wines and then I would try and think about when would be the correct time to give those wines to someone without enforcing just what I'd read onto the customer. Um, but that, and then you would taste the wine that you'd read and that kind of cemented into your memory what that wine was. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it was that kind of, I think it's going to be like this. Now I've tasted it. Yes, it does. Oh my God, I love that wine. I'm going to remember this. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And traveling as well, is it part of your experience, like wine experience? It was. Yeah. I mean, it was so much easier before, you know, you you could and wine suppliers could take you away. So, yeah, I used to travel a lot and it was done a lot more. I now have, you know, I've got two children now um, and in a kind of like post-COVID world, you can just see it's not happening as much. But yeah, like I was saying to you about, you know, the regions that mean the most to me, it's because I've been there, you know, and you walk in the vineyards, you meet producers and every time you talk about that wine, your mind is is going to that place. And so, yeah, it's, it's in, integral and it's amazing. But also, I think we live in a world right now where that's not necessarily always possible. So how, you know, how do you get that experience for yourself? Um, and also, how do you give that to your guests? And actually, I did do a tasting um, that Ted Lemon from Literai mm-hmm. did. And I mean, this is a winery that has got, you know, they, they've got a good budget behind what they did, but he'd actually used Google Maps and had gone down into all of the vineyards and done like 360 tours and taken photos and loaded that up onto Google Maps. So we did this presentation and you're starting looking at this, where he is based as well. Geographically, it doesn't maybe look so far away, but you've got this huge ridge that's almost impossible. It's very, very slow to drive. So if you did go and visit him, you actually wouldn't be able to cover the kind of amount of land that we did in the presentation. So you're up and you're looking where everything is, and then he's zooming right down. And then it is like you're standing in the vineyard and you're tasting the wine at the same time. And it was brilliant. It was so, so good. And you did get that kind of from Mm -hmm. Clapham where I was doing it, that sort of sense of place. So I think there is a future where we can deliver it but you've got to think you know a a lot about it but yeah ultimately being able to visit something as you can't you can't beat it right yeah 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 makes sense absolutely good right i'm done with my one question so (laughs) i think (laughs) sorry i'm giving very long answers back to to the restaurant um (laughs) katie if we're working for you one of your three non-negotiables you're working for me (laughs) that sounds good doesn't it (laughs) Um, what are my three non-negotiables? Um, I mean, I'm, I've got so many. No, that's actually not true. I'm, rudeness, like you just straight out, it's just not acceptable anymore to be, I think, rude to each other, you know, up the hierarchy, down the hierarchy from customer to staff, staff to customer. So I'd say that is a non-negotiable. Um, Mm-hmm. It's all right if you don't like wine, but if you do like bad wine, that's that's probably going to be a bit of a non-negotiable. Right? 
Um, and then what would be the third one? You've got to care. I think, you yeah. know, that's the most important thing. And I think I've I've struggled with some of the people that we've hired and I've probably known that they weren't right, but I hoped that they would be. Um, but if you don't care, that is, yeah, that that's a, a line for me that mm. like, why are you here? Like, this isn't the business for you. There are lots of businesses that you can do a good job in and not give that but mm. in my business you have to care and when you feel that a person is not right what do you do how do you handle it there's the door yeah it's yeah. it's hard it's hard it is you know it, it is really challenging because i think there's that part of you that kind of mm. wants to try and make it work um and we went through um post covid has actually been for me as a restaurant um, employer at the most challenging time. And when we came back um, after, God, there's so many of them, but like basically kind of like when we properly came back after the big second lockdown, I think we felt at Lorna, I don't know if you guys had the same, that there was this like push for this one big recovery. So we couldn't find any staff. We were all working, all of the hours under the sun. And then when Omicron came, I suddenly realized, oh my God, this isn't going to be a one recovery. This could just keep going. And we can't keep stretching ourselves so thin, everybody picking mm -hmm. up all these extra shifts. But we also hired a lot of the wrong people at that point, just because we needed people. And I sat down with my management team um, in early last year, and I knew that people were just tired and a bit burnt out. And it was, it was the hardest conversation that I've ever had to listen to because these were the people that are the most integral to my business that stuck with me through COVID and I valued so much and every single one of them said they hated their job and that they mm. hated um yeah being in restaurants and I just I never wanted anybody to feel that way and I knew that I hadn't made them feel that way but my business was making them feel that way and so we talked a lot about it and then we just it broke down to there were too many of the wrong people working for us so we made some like quite hard decisions and I shut the restaurant quite a lot of days of the week actually we ended up to begin with closing it too many which just didn't sort of business-wise work but I just said right no more wrong people that's it they're gone and we have to build the restaurant with the right people because your brand is the most important thing. And we have spent too much time working on that. And these people are trashing it because they don't care. And from that point, we've been much stricter that if somebody isn't right, it's okay to just say to them, this isn't for you. We're not going to just keep trying to make a square peg mm -hmm. fit a, a round hole. I'm not as brave as David to just say, <laughs> there's the door. Um, and we used to joke in the old days that I'd sit someone down to kind of, because I needed to, give them a disciplinary and we'd walk out and I'd be like, so they, they've got a promotion. Um, I'm not sure how that's worked. <laughs> and I got a bit better with that now. But yeah, it's just being brave enough to say, this isn't the right fit, you know, and it's not you, it's not me, it's not the right fit. Mm -hmm. that's not, let's not go on with this anymore. And it's difficult because you know that means you're not going to have days off. You know what? Your, your yeah, life is going to short term, get harder. And you don't want that. But actually long term, working with people that are the right people and you've got each other's back because mm -hmm. we care. Mm -hmm. That's... That's Absolutely. the most important thing. Yeah. And I was uh, working with David. <laughs> that was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. You can be honest now. It was now. a long time ago. You can ago. tell him. Um, so one of the first interactions I remember with, that I remember with David, because, you know, he was the restaurant manager. So, of course, he was my boss. But my, my kind of direct boss um, day to day was Terry. But I do remember him sitting me down. <laughs> and I think actually I did get a pay rise off the back of this, but he did say, um, I didn't think you were going to make it. And I remember at that point, and I don't actually normally work particularly well with that being kind of like poked, but I do just remember thinking, I am going to prove you wrong. I am going to prove you wrong. I'm going to do this. And I mean, I, th I think it, it, I don't know if it was a, uh, a strategy. It was a risky one because I think there's a good chance I would just be like, all right, well, see you later. <laughs> see ya, <yeah. laughs> um, but it it did work. But 
I think you know, David has got exceptionally high standards and I think that's scary, but I also think you need to have pride in what you do. I think that anyway, it's so integral for me. And so being around somebody like David gave me pride in what I was working for and what we were achieving at She Bruce because I saw how much it meant to him. So that rubbed up on me. And, you know, I, I wanted to prove him wrong. But I think one of the key things that I felt with David, when David was there and we had a service, even if perhaps he was thinking, oh, crap, this is going to be a nightmare. He never, ever made it feel that way. And I always felt it's going to be all right because David's there. We're going to, mm. service is going to be fine. And he always put out this very calm performance. And I think that is so important because I've worked with other managers and you can see they're kind of like really it's flapping right, and that just yeah. filters all the way through your team. And so I think that importance of just be calm, lead the team in a really calm way is something that he instilled in me mm. that was really, really important. Um, so, I mean, I, I think you know, lots of the, the people who work with David will say he was a hard man to work for, um, but at the same time, a very inspiring person to, to work for. I think he hasn't changed though, over the years, obviously, like this. Yeah. So tell us about your current business, Lawn. You've mentioned it a lot, but... Um... Yeah, so... Lawn is, um, it's a small restaurant based in Pimlico, sort of Victoria. Um, it's owned by, by me. The head chef is um, a guy called Graham Brown. Mm -hmm. And we met each other working at the square. Um, and he has worked at uh, similar restaurants to me. He, he worked at La Trompette. He worked at Kitchen W8. Um, also a bit of time at 11 Madison Park, which <laughs> is always good for like pumping up the importance of the restaurant by saying we, we had some three-star experience <laughs> there. Um, but we're kind of, we're cut from the same cloth in terms of the, the sort of type of food. And it's, I think it's quite similar to meddler food. It's modern British, it's seasonally led, but with perhaps a slightly more kind of like classical sort of background to it. Um, the, the restaurant itself, it's about, you know, when I've talked about this exceptional quality, that obviously is something that hopefully people feel when they come in the door. But my experience over the years has been that I just wanted something a little bit more relaxed. So I think we are a neighborhood restaurant. It feels just, you know, like an, a really lovely local neighborhood, but we've really stripped back on a lot of the things. So we don't have tablecloths and, you know, the, there are no uniforms for the staff and it should just feel a bit more kind of informal and relaxed. I like to think it's got a very small shop front, two steps and you've walked past it. I like to think when you open the door at all, you suddenly think, oh, like, what's this little place I've come into? It's just got this lovely kind of like secret little feeling. And the, the restaurant itself, I think, has quite a sort of domestic almost kind of feel to it. So it's this idea, it's this almost kind of extension of, of home that you feel, oh, when you walk in the door and it just feels a bit special. Um, yeah, we've been open since 2017. Um, I think you should also say that it's quite wine-driven restaurant. Yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously with my background. Yes, okay. um, but at the same time, it's, it's always that balance of getting it right. You know, you, you want to have, well, I just love wine. And so I you always end up tasting that, and being yeah. like, let's list it, let's list it. Um, but you don't <laughs> want that to kind of get out of control. But yeah, we are, we're a wine-friendly yeah. destination. Yeah, yeah, wine-friendly. Wine-friendly yeah. is the right word. Are we ready for our fire round? Quick fire questions. The last question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not we did, you did that in the we? brief now. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, I think you already answered this question, but if you if I would ask you who is your biggest inspiration in the wine industry? I mean in the industry in general. Um I, I guess it probably has to be for me, Terry, because he's mm, the, the key so. person for me. Yeah. And anyone outside the industry that you look up to? Not yet. There's lots of people yeah. outside that I <laughs> That I look up to. Um, look, I think as as a as a woman who owns her own business, who's mm -hmm. also a mum, I think I look to a lot of of other women. So, I mean, I do. I constantly think somebody like Michelle Obama is incredible, but I think probably it's got to be it's got to be my mum and my friends, um, my other girlfriends, who just inspire me all the time. Amazing, good, and yeah, best Go service experience. 
Hmm, okay. Actually from front of house serving me or just best like experience eating in a, a restaurant? We're gonna, you're gonna be the first one, but you can answer both of them if you have to, to okay. say. <laughs> so after I got married, um, we went to Royal Hospital Road for dinner. Um, and it, it was so slick. It was just, you know, like watching the most beautiful performance and it was incredible. Um, best meal um, that I've had would probably be at the River Cafe with friends, mm-hmm. sat outside on a sunny day, drinking fantastic wines because it was probably on my staff discount, eating <laughs> incredible, <laughs> incredible food and just feeling like yeah. life doesn't get any better than this. Amazing. Yeah. And what does your lazy dinner look like? At home. Oh, I love that um, you're Italian. So, uh, and I'm not even going to try it. It's the pasta that's like so long, but it's basically just spaghetti with like garlic and herbs and I don't, I don't like know it. chili. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> it's like spaghetti, e aglio, blah, 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 blah. Ah, aglio, aglio, peperoncino. Okay. Yes. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and we're, <laughs> we're like, I'm going to be so invited or something. <laughs> Yeah, so just to get you with yeah. some chili herbs and garlic and maybe some yeah, yeah, or yeah. anchovies on toast. I, I love salty, savory yeah. food. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm. Man, it's easy. Is there a book that's inspired you? Um I I did read Danny Meyer, but it was quite a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so probably setting the table by by Danny Meyer is is important to people. But I don't know. I don't even know if it's relevant anymore. I'm sure it is. Um Yeah, I'm reading yeah. it now. I can see uh, I get some good mm-hmm. stuff from uh, from that book. Yeah. And a lot of actually what you said, like especially like the massive ag, like when people felt like they've just been agged, I think is actually what you says in this book. And I read it like okay. two days ago. And okay. I felt like, oh, she read it. She knows. <laughs> and actually you just say no. So yeah, it was it's genuine for sure. Yeah. And desert island wine? Yes, exactly. Uh, well, it has to be. Um, and I do, I hope Bruce Paul is listening to this because he'll know the answer. Um, it's got to be Talana Classico. Talana Classico. Yeah, we were, he used to always say like, do you sell anything else, Katie? But you know what? From, from when I first started, it used to be by the glass and it cost nothing. We drank it at my wedding um, and I'm still not bored of it um, because it just, it's refreshing, but it's got a little bit of body. So I'm not going to choose something you know, ridiculously expensive. Um, I mean, maybe a Ravenel shall we? But Talana <laughs> okay. Classico. <laughs> Fair enough. Amazing. Thank you so much, Katie. Katie, it's been amazing to listen to you today. Oh, thank and, you very much um, for having me. You certainly proved me wrong anyway. Go back to that meeting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> In a good way and I couldn't be proud. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Katie. Guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Drive for Service podcast. Follow us on Instagram at Medlar Chelsea and make sure you like and subscribe for future episodes.